Hello, everyone. This is Jeanette Hill Lewis, or is it Lewis Hill or Hill Lewis? I'm sorry. It's it's Lewis Hill. <laughs> Lewis Hill. Jeanette Lewis Hill. I'm so sorry. I wrote it down and then I didn't look at it. And she's going to be one of our simulcast presenters for Breaking Down the Borders. Jeanette, is this your first time doing a Borders uh, conference? Yes, it is my first time. Yes. Well, and you're not even doing it right. The rest of us have been doing it online with no people in the room for five years. <laughs> and you're breaking the mold oh. here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a year to break the mold, I think. It, it's a little bit like doing radio. I've had experience with that, too. And I've found that uh, I can do much better, speak much better if I hike into the studio, even if I have to go into the city, and talk to another person. And this was the idea of the organizer, Chris Turner, who felt that people brought forward uh, their best if they had a room full of people to talk to. It's what we're used to, particularly the older generation. And so we will have uh, a number of people in the room that we're speaking to, and that talk will also simultaneously go out on the Breaking Down the Borders conference. I'm is thrilled with this for a different reason, not so much about your um, your your comfort level at speaking to people, but it looks as though conferences have become they've not only because of the virus situation, which is impacting us right now. Conferences have become prohibitively expensive. Traveling to conferences, um, yes. uh, the hotel costs. Speakers don't make any money. You know, it usually costs them money to travel. It's not um, a sustainable model for astrology, and yet we want to be together. It's not the same to just, I mean, I can take classes online all day long, and it's not the same as being in a room with my pals. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's true. Uh, COVID has done us a real favor, I think, especially over here since we are isolated. Uh, I'm speaking from Perth. Um, because I've started uh, picking up on podcasts, which is not something I've been in the habit of doing before. And it's brilliant, some of the stuff that's coming through. I've just loved sure, it. Yeah. It's been a good experience. And at the same time, in Australia, we'd sort of almost hit an impasse for all the reasons that you have mentioned. Uh, that the conferences are, they're very expensive. Uh, hiring venues here, it, it's invariably in a university. Uh, it takes two, three, four people a couple of years to, to plan a conference. Uh, if you've done yeah. event stuff, I've done event stuff in other fields and, oh gee, it, it's very hard work. And this has been kind of volunteer labor. It's too big, it's too hard. And this, mm -hmm. this really works for people like us. I mean, we're, we're not in New York City or Denver or someplace like that where there's already a big group. They have a big group in Sydney, uh, in Melbourne. They have big groups. Um, Queensland, South Australia are doing pretty well. Uh, Western Australia, there aren't that many of us. So for us, the experience is it's fabulous. It's nice to connect. And I think if conferences take on a new, and this is why I was excited and volunteered to work with Borders in this capacity. I've helped with other things before, but I think it's an exciting concept that we could have live conferences that are just smaller but still connected. So regional, like regionally people could get together, like the people that are in, you could travel in Texas, you know, to, if you lived in Texas, you could travel anywhere in Texas and it's a huge state and still not incur the kind of expenses that you do if you have to fly, particularly if you have to fly overseas. You know, if you're going to a community that has an active astrology group, you, there could be, you know, house sharing and many, many ways that we could reduce the cost and still be together. Now, I wouldn't want to always be together with my same people. <laughs> I'd like to see the other people too. <laughs> but I think that it could evolve into a new model, you know? And uh, I think it's fun. Yeah. I think it could. And one of the things that occurs to me is you can have specialist groups then. Uh, I do horary astrology, which I love. Uh, and that's a specialty. And that's certainly not a small group. But, you know, you, you could just have a horary conference. 
I've taken, yes. I've been up to Bali. I've been over to uh, country Victoria in Australia for uh, horary groups um, and the medical astrology group I did. Um, there, there are these specialties that fascinate people, and we can do that. Yes. I did yes. uh, Deborah Holdings School, um, one of her special trainings in 2015. And I had to try, travel mm -hmm. to San Francisco to do it from Pennsylvania. So that was a pricey trip, but it was worth it. It was a five-day yeah, well, it, so, yeah. It, it was Deborah's uh, horary workshop I did in Bali. So, And Bali, for us, is very close. It, it's about a three-hour flight north, which three hours from Perth is, is nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was, apart oh. from the fact that we all got the flu, which I think was considerably worse than most cases of COVID, we were sick. <laughs> but anyway, um, it, it was good for, it was a good seminar. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know about the flu part, but it sounds wonderful. I no. <laughs> All right. So your your talk, um, it's called, I'll, I'll be sure and read this time. Our number is 12. Okay. Yes, that's right. I mean, okay. Thought, okay, 12, 12 apostles, 12, you know, 12 signs, 12, but what else? How does uh, it? It's actually, it's supposed to be, uh, I believe it is, the number of cosmological uh, structure. The structure of the universe is held to actually be 12. Uh, there are different really? things that got me fascinated in this. Um, one of them is that I just, because, as I said, I do horary, and I wanted more information on Arabic parts. So I got into okay. Robert Zoller's book on the Arabic parts. And in the beginning okay. of the book, he has a long section where he describes numbers, number one, number two, number three. And I had tried to enter numerology through the, the normal channels um, to find out something about it, and it never clicked with me. But when I encountered Zoller's work, this was very deeply metaphysical and just generally very deep. And I thought, wow, this is the kind of number I like. At the same time, I have a head for geometry. Uh, in one of my incarnations, you might say, when I was younger, I was a draftsman. I did mainly mechanical and architectural sort of work. I can handle geometry, and I got into sacred geometry and mm -hmm. encountered the English author John Michel, who wrote a book called Sacred Geometry and several others. And the man is like a magician, but I'm just, and I'm a Capricorn son, by the way, if you're trying to link this up, astrologically because I love structure. I'm a Scorpio <laughs> moon, which I don't always admit to, but the Scorpio likes to know what really is going on. So yes, that Scorpio true. moon needed to be satisfied. Um, and I came across one of John Michel's books written with a Christine Roan uh, on 12 tribe nations. Now this was about ancient civilizations and some not so ancient this is recorded right up to the 1800s um groups well you could call them societies small societies greece uh was supposed to have one such society centered on delphi uh, the societies were divided into 12 parts generally around a 13th part uh that would be central uh, in an ideally situated landmass. There are actually 12 sections, like 12 states or 12 counties. Um, each county would be patterned after a certain sign of the zodiac. Uh, they would each be in rulership during the period that, that the sun was passing through that particular zodiacal sign. Now these go way back. Wow. And the history that I initially heard about the development of the Zodiac was it took a long time to come up with 12 signs. The research that I've come across here suggests that cultures understood that 12 was a very important number in cosmic structure a long, long, long time ago, thousands of years back, because Plato wrote about this. And 
a lot of it was like lost in history to him. He didn't know what was true, what was not true. But the work uh, that various archaeologists have done has unco and uncovered, uncovered actual societies, actual evidence uh, of these 12 parts. England had bits of this um, that, that were quite visible. Ireland had it. So everything you can think that a zodiac sign and its ruling planet might refer to was taken up by um, the particular 112 segment of society. So Aries people um, during their period of governance during the year, uh, they govern 112th of the year obviously, um, they might wear, uh, wear red for sake of argument, sing, uh, constant singing was something, and the choral uh, choral work in the larger societies, uh, some places, especially in the British Isles, endeavored to have constant song. So you had this constant uplifting song. Uh, they would uh, they would uphold other qualities of the zodiacal sign. Um, they would perhaps enact their particular mythology of what Aries meant act out that part. Uh, but the idea behind it was that if you anchor the structure of the cosmos onto the earth, then you can live in a cosmic perfected fashion uh, and society will respond to this and you will actually, you will progress. It, it was more than an insurance policy for, for the success of a society. It was like an act of worship. Um, but the model for worship was the structure of the cosmos. So one example that was recorded was Iceland. Uh, that was um, taken over by, I think they came from Norway, uh, the yes. settlers in Iceland. And in about the 800s, 900s, they established a 12-part society. So that's certainly within recorded history. And the skill set that the, the people have um, just shoots upward. They, they gather more skills. Um, they become much more successful. Things run well. Things run smoothly. It's intensely ceremonial. And each, each uh, segment uh, would be ruled, each of the 12 segments, for 30 days. Then you've got the extra days left over in the year because they knew how to calculate a year. And the 13th part, uh, the central administration would take over and they would have grand festivals and meetings, administrative meetings during that time. And that then occurred to me, well, you know, 12 is a solar number. Uh, the sun goes through the zodiac, uh, you know, in our system in its 12 months, it's a solar number, but the lunar number is 13. We have uh, not quite 13 months uh, of the moon in the course of one solar year, but the 12 and the 13 link up with each other, uh, solar and lunar. You can even link them geometrically. I've come across a, a diagram to do that. Um, so I thought that, well, this this is almost like the alchemical sacred or cosmic marriage, you know, you get the, the moon and the sun, the male and the female principles married together. So this sort of stuff really got me going. I was so fascinated by it because while I like things like horror astrology and I'm a little bit traditional without being fully um, Hellenistic or whatever, uh, the spiritual and, and metaphysical dimensions of astrology are something that absolutely fascinate me. And the fact that these groups lived like this in ancient and even not so ancient history, I, I was just so excited when I found this out. So um, I had to share that. It's I've given a talk a on holism that we don't have at all now. Everything is so fractured, but there's, there's a sense of, of a holistic um, connection yeah. with earth and sky, society and Yes, humans. that's right. It's it's anchoring cosmic energy onto Earth in a society. But the thing, the price that these people had to pay, and I don't think they saw it as much of a price then, but it was absolute conformity. So can you imagine today taking a country 
uh, say, to say take England because it's smaller than America or Australia, um, and telling people they can only sing sacred music. Can you imagine? Uh, you know, somebody eventually always comes up with rock music <laughs> and starts, starts <laughs> playing that, <laughs> and the society starts disintegrating. So this is a, a pattern. This is a cosmic pattern these societies followed. And everything is great. So that they, they know historically, at least in a few cases, that people's level of civilization really rose. Uh, and the number 12 is very much associated with the golden age. So the levels of society really rose. And uh, then when it finally began to break down, people no longer wanted to follow the pattern, uh, they would sink again. They'd go down. So I just found that utterly fascinating. Um, that will be part of the talk that I will give, but also just working with the number 12 itself. Um, it has so many numbers, uh, like you can divide one, two, three, four, and six easily into 12. Five fits with 12 geometrically. I should have brought my little model. I don't think I've got it in the studio here. But I'm, I did a little origami dodecahedron, and that's you know a twelve-sided <laughs> model, <laughs> and every face of it is pentagonal, you know, five-sided figure. So twelve and five meet that way. Um, that's crazy. Twelve is considered I'm a, I'm a number of sonic solids um, from TCR. yeah, yeah. It's oh, good. Okay, yeah. Well, this this is my ex art studio. I uh, eventually quit. A few years after my husband retired, ahem, but that's a different story. Uh, so yeah, art is um, is one of my great loves. One of my great loves. Um, so I did a lot of origami for a while and was quite fascinated by that. Uh, the number seven, of course, doesn't uh, match with number twelve mathematically, except three plus four is seven. Uh, is, is sorry. Yeah, three plus four is seven. Three times four is 12. So you get mm -hmm. a certain link between the two that way. And there is a geometric link, but I think it might be a little bit too abstruse. It's one that I can't hold in my head at the moment. Uh, <laughs> so I've, I won't go there. Uh, the number nine is composed of threes. The number 12 is composed of threes. You can make excuses for everything except 11. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> mathematically, 12 and its components um, form the, the language of astrology. You know, mm -hmm. the, the one is, is the unity, two is the opposition, uh, three is the, the creativity or the pleasures, etc. You know, four is, is the confrontation. Uh, I've taken some of my material from looking at harmonics which is not a field I get into very much, but especially with the, the five and the seven, I was looking at fifth and seven harmonic, and I got into the old book by David Hamblin, um, that's his name, I think, yeah, Hamblin, um, who discussed very intelligently the qualities of two-ness and three-ness, four-ness, five-ness, uh, seven-ness especially, and looking at that, which just gives a bit of additional character and sort of archetypal stuff to the numbers, like five uh, being a number of order, uh, very much a number of order, and five is the number of man. Um, seven is more an inspirational number. So this sort of thing has a link with astrology. Uh, so I'm talking very much in this section also about the components of 12. And it makes a difference uh, because initially, I said Robert Zoller got me going with his incredible writings on number in the Arabic parts book, which I've read and reread because it's not simple stuff. Uh, it really isn't. It's, it's very, very deep. But he said, we can't understand the Arabic parts or anything else uh, until we really understand number. That's paraphrasing. And I thought, I think that's important too. And so I just made it my business to go into that. But then uh, discovering the depth of knowledge in the ancient times, uh, 
on the number 12 and it's it's importance it, like that is cosmic structure i was just blown away by that if you study if you're an art teacher so you're going to find a 12 part geometry in ancient cathedrals um in paintings the structure of paintings certainly uh, it yes, is in it's in music it's in music is a very important part it's in i don't nature. have a musical it's in sorry in what it's in nature Yes, it sacred is in nature. Geometry. Yeah, uh, the sacred geometry is... Twelves are a bit hard to find in nature. Uh, soap bubbles evidently will compact uh, and turn into little dodecahedrons when they, when they compact. And I thought that was good. And certain minerals, I think galena, which I believe is a zinc ore, um, a couple of other things, but there's not a lot of twelve in nature. Although 12 is implied by nature, 5 is everywhere, five and 4, of course. And you know with a cube, it has 12 edges. So the 4 and the 12 link in oh. that way that we, yeah, yeah, so there you go. That got to me. <laughs> I did think of it for a minute. Yeah. And your yeah. workshop, yeah. you should give people paper and let them fold it so they'll have a tactile experience of it. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, people have asked me to give classes in origami, and uh, I haven't done that, but maybe it would be. It's good to have hands-on stuff. When I, I first so. got into sacred geometry, it was a book by Robert Lawler, and I actually took paper and a compass and a straight edge. It's all you need, and I constructed all of the shapes. Did you? All of the shapes. <laughs> I just... I love it. I, I don't tell many people that because people think I'm weird. <laughs> so, uh, no, but I, I think uh, you were born for this. This is your calling. How long did it take it, you in your journey in astrology to discover this? Uh, a long time because I was still a fully functioning artist. I started astrology in 1981 um, through a set of circumstances. But I was... Um, actually in art school at that point and I, I did two lots of art school here both here in Perth and had been already exhibiting and selling really on a regular basis got into curating so my astrological start was a bit slow um, and I didn't discover the Zoller material until sometime in this century which I know is already 20 years old so <laughs> it's been a little <laughs> while uh, but I think I've really been going on this topic probably the last the last five years, just this this whole business is the the relation beginning to get a handle of it in the astrology, and it's important. It should lead to applied astrology, but when you see the cultural and mythical and non mythical and historical implications of what was understood as number twelve, uh, I just think that's incredible. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> Yes. Saturn paid a visit. <laughs> <laughs> Was that it? Oh, I see his head. Oh, well, my, yeah. mine is also that, black, that but is much bigger. <laughs> that is bad monkey. He's he's one of five, actually six, because there's a kitten downstairs that may or may not stay. Oh, oh, um, oh well, I was no. going to ask you, what's the practical? I have a Capricorn moon, so what is the practical? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Uh, this, the practical application, I think, is a really profound understanding of aspects. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I I think so. I think that's important. Um, the, I mean, the twelveness we do, uh, we break it down into components. So one is the practical use in uh, in your astrological practice, and I will be looking more at quintiles, for example. I've actually been looking, I've been rereading one of, um, well, Carl Jung's autobiography, the Memories, Dreams, and Reflections book. And I thought, this guy has got to have incredible um, aspects, uh, uh, harmonics, and fifth harmonic, the seventh harmonic, um, and He's actually one of the examples I discovered in my astrological harmonics reference. How interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you said um, that and, just from reading his biography or his, not his biography, but his works. 
I did because you know what Jung was like. He he was uh, he was into astrology. Um, he was into the mythology, into archetypal things, uh, and had a very good understanding of the structure of the universe. And his father was a preacher who was struggling constantly with his faith. And Jung just couldn't couldn't get it with the Christian way of presenting faith. He built his own much deeper faith that was built on experience. He's a very spiritual man, was. Um, yeah, and so I thought, well, you know, that sounds very seventh harmonic. And anyway, uh, yeah, where were we going with this? But Oh, yes, practical applications. But I think it, in a lot of respects, this can give a profounder sense of what we're truly working with. If you can get into archetypes of number, and don't ask me questions on that now because I can't come up with sort of picture stories for number, but um, two-ness, to me, I see an opposition um, with the, you know, the, the quality of two-ness. And there is this confrontation mm -hmm. or this idea of projection when uh, you project your own faults on other people, uh, that sort mm -hmm. of a thing. Um, and the threeness, the, just the, the easy flowing, uh, pleasurable or creative number. But according to Robert Zoller, and, he, and he's according to very ancient sources, three is the first real number. One is unity. You can't count it as a number. Two is unity's first ability to regard itself. Um, Projected. And it has to split itself in order to regard itself. And so mm -hmm. they are the stuff of um, creation. And then one and two get together and create three. But Zoller says three and four were simultaneously created together. And I thought, oh my God, how do you get your head around that sort of thing? It's the but, Gemini twins, obviously. Yeah, the Gemini <laughs> friends. Out, and of course, three, time, three times four, what do we look for when our eyes first fall on the chart if we have the aspect lines turned on? Uh, the squares and the trines. And then of uh, the conjunctions, of course, too. The, the conjunctions. Uh, sextiles, they're, they're a little bit more distant. Uh, oppositions, um, but anyway, it, that's it's the, the very much the basic stuff of astrology. So it's I different. think just a profounder, yeah, a profounder understanding, but perhaps uh, leading us a little more into what we call the harmonics, uh, which can get very, very uh, sort of what's the word, out there. Uh, I've heard people talking on the 19th harmonic and the 23rd harmonic, and I'm not inclined to go there. Um, those are prime numbers, I think. Um, so that, that's another whole study, and 12 is full of prime numbers, <laughs> the first several. But I think those, those nice numbers contained within our astrological patterns, uh, I think getting more into the harmonics, the ninth harmonic, I believe, is very uh, sensitively treated by Vedic astrologers. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's, David it's, Corcoran told me I had a really powerful ninth harmonic chart. So I think that's a good whatever. thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever yeah that I think it is. <laughs> I'm a big fan of his. You'd like his work, I think, David Corcoran. Corcoran. Yeah. Yeah, he's been here at least a couple of times, I think, because I've met him at conferences. And I did go to one of his harmonics lectures. And he was he was talking about those things. And he does wonderful work. But it's certainly beyond the scope of, of what I'm thinking with what I'm presenting. Let me put it that way. But well, it's amazing. He, um, he does. He has a lot, a lot, a lot of online videos on YouTube. So you can indulge when oh. you have fun. <laughs> That's a that's a good idea. I'll do that. I'm getting a cramp in my phone arm. <laughs> I know I did too, a little while ago. Um, so do you yeah. think this applies also to the houses and the structure of the twelve houses? Uh, yeah, the, I should be mentioning it because obviously we have the twelve signs and the twelve houses. Uh, what I saw initially. Um, was with the one, two, and three, and if we're looking especially at quadrant house systems, 
I could see the cardinal fixed mutable thing in the numbers themselves. One is oh, obviously yeah. the unity. Uh, the two, you're looking at the opposition, but you know how when you have to make a decision, you fight with yourself about it. You have to buy a new car and you have endless conversations with your inner other person. Um, well, that's only and if it, you're not an air sign. If you're an air sign, you talk to everyone you know about it. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, well, I do have air rising, but <laughs> that's my, my saving grace. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, it leads to a great deal of deliberation, and I see that as a fixity. I'm married to a Taurus here, an Australian Taurus, and I have learned about deliberation. I won't even go into museums with that guy when we're traveling. He memorizes everything. I go and have a coffee and I look at the people. But anyway, I, I see two as relating to fixity. And I see three uh, just through what we all commonly know as a trine. It's a much more lighthearted thing. And I see the adaptability of the mutable signs. So I see that. Uh, then so we can just follow the chart around in, in those, and each, each of the... Yeah. Well, the cardinal fixed mutable. Um, yes. But that's not an area that I have yet developed very much. I've been looking more at the aspects, and of course the orientation that we have on planet Earth, and the fact that on Earth we try to bring the heaven to Earth. I mean, that's getting back to the culture. But the orientation, the number four, you've got the four angles, you've got the four yes. directions, you've got the four humors, if you get into medical astrology, which fascinates me. Yes, everything. Is yeah, everything. yeah, the four seasons, well, yeah, we sort of have that here. <laughs> um, so uh, the houses... Uh, yeah, I haven't, it's, it's an area that since this is in November, I've developed pretty much everything else but the houses. Um, I just thought since you were interested and, in horary that the houses would be a special draw to you. And it, and they are, saying, I love the houses. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, horary is psychologically, it's a much more simple thing. To me, anyway, people have specific questions. You go to specific areas, uh, and the houses, yeah, they mean so much. And choosing the right house is a huge thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that choice making, I would have to consider if the the quality of number that we're working with here, if that really applies as much in horary. It may not. I'm looking more at the, the birth chart or the charts of countries, which is pretty fascinating stuff. And the, and the aspects. Um, yes. Yeah, that's right. So did you know, I'm sure you do, uh, that America's headed for its Pluto return <laughs> Yeah. quite soon? Yeah, and it's going to have its Neptune opposition at the same time. So that's going to be interesting. Um, These things anyway. Happen. These Just things happen, thing. yeah. Well, the Saturn-Pluto Saturn -Pluto conjunction happened uh, on within half a degree of, I think that was right, my chart ruler, which is Venus. I'm a liberal oh rising. Yeah, I know. That's I what I said. Also. So I guess, yeah, I don't so know. It depends on the degree of rising. I think I'm nine or ten. So not quite, but. Yeah, but, yep. So. It happened to me uh, once before in the 80s. Um, Saturn-Pluto conjunction was on my... I'm sorry, on the what? Did I lose you? Are you still there? Hello? Oh, I can hear you now. You're back. Oh, Hello. that's good. I, I, Yeah, I'm back. So what happened is... Um, this is a Sony phone, and my thumb slid onto a button that it shouldn't have. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> so, you said Saturn Pluto in the 80s uh, landed on what? On my ascendant. On your ascendant, okay. Yeah. 
And so now they've, they've landed on the ruler of my ascendant. They've dispersed now. My ascendant's at 23 of, Lib, of uh, Capricorn. Uh, no, my, sorry. The ruler of the ascendant is at 23 Capricorn. The ascendant is uh, 24, 25 Libra. Yep. So, yeah. So anyway, that's um, but that's, 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 that's you, not you part. You were meant to do this. This has all come about. You yeah. found everything you needed. Mm. I did, yes. Excuse me for a tick. <coughs> One small well, non-COVID cough. Sorry. Well, that's all right. I have a mask somewhere I can put on. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what do you want your um, audience to take away then from your lecture? I would like to have them sort of with happy hearts because they feel much more connected uh, with the real meat and bones of the universe. I would also like them to be re-inspired to look more deeply into aspects um, and into the way everything knits together. I think the universe, personally, I think the universe is very holographic. And I would like to see them feel much more intimately a part of this this holograph because everything really does go so much together astrology doesn't deserve to be sidelined the way it, it often no, is no. it really is a central very deeply metaphysical and meta scientific i don't think that's a word but i think there's such a thing as meta science and i think that's what we do um and i i just think that the whole Oh, well, the wholeness that it brings up, it, it literally brings up, you know, with a W, a wholeness, um, yes. is just wholeness so is magical. Good word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, it there's is. a lot of numbers in magic, too. There are magic squares, and there's a lot of, a lot of, I love magic squares. Numbers. Aren't they yeah. cool? And w my favorite magic square because of the enigma is the sun, because it adds up to 666. And when I found that out, I thought, wait a minute, what's this thing about that being an evil number? Can't be. That's the sun. <laughs> so, uh, which yeah. Which is also Apollo, which, you know, I mean, there's, it's probably twisted yes. up in there somewhere. <laughs> yes, it probably is. Apollo, yes, definitely being the, he, I think he was the um, archetypal god for Aries. That makes sense. I, yeah, yeah. I'll have to review that, but I, I believe he was, yeah. So we have very good archetypal astrology. It's too bad everybody can't be with you and in, in are you is it going to be in Perth? The gathering? The simulcast? Oh the, the, it will be in Perth somewhere, yeah. It's it, probably in what we call South Perth. Perth is split by a river, although the city is is sitting on the north part, but there's a South Perth on the south side of the river, so we're very central where we gather. And I don't think I'm going to make it this year, but maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, if things are still the same in November, you don't want to do two weeks quarantine in a hotel at your own expense. That's the current thing. Very few people doing it. I have a good friend who went to visit family in Thailand. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, but our hotels are pretty expensive here. <laughs> Everything is in Oz. Well, so, it sounds like it's going to be fabulous. So this talk is called Our Number is 12, which encompasses everything. And it's on November 6th here in the States where I am. It's at 6 a.m. to 7.13 a.m. with Jeanette Lewis-Hill. However, if you are interested in this talk and you can't be there for the uh, live um, simulcast, you can... Uh, purchase the lecture and you'll receive the recording of it for those of you who are not early risers like me so this is one i think we don't want to miss <laughs> thank you for talking with us that's my pleasure i enjoyed it thank you terry i hope to meet you someday in person jeanette i hope you do come out and see us it's good here australia is on my bucket list for sure <laughs> that's good <laughs> Take care. You too. Bye-bye.